It's always fun discussing who would win or who's the most powerful of any franchise, and it certainly never leads to petty arguments that suck all the fun out of the room. Today we're throwing our hat into the Thronesverse to give our top 10 fighters who hail from Westeros during the A Song of Ice and Fire era. We were going to do the Thronesverse as a whole, but then Tom kindly reminded me we don't have much footage of the Hot D or Sir Duncan characters yet, and there's so many great warriors across the sea that they deserve their own list. So perhaps they're separate videos that can lead to a greatest of all time video to cap it off. You know the drill with YouTube, got to milk the concept. For this one, it's not just a trial by combat scenario, like our mountain vid or them at their peak most prepared set up as was the case with our Jamie vs Oberyn vid. We'll be judging them as fighters in the overall sense, so we considered how we think they'd fare on the battlefield, in a duel and in a brawl-like scuffle, as well as with and without prep. But when we say without prep, we obviously mean they have a weapon and armor to hand, but are just dropped in cold. And finally, books or show? Yes. Anyway, let's crack on. At number 10, we have the mountain that rides, Sir Gregor Clegane. Seriously, Tom, if we don't stop addressing this detestable asshole in our videos, people are going to think we're in love with him or something. But in a video about the best warriors, he's kind of hard to discount. Gregor is something of a gatekeeper to the top tier, representing the caliber of fighter one needs to be to make the cut. Show watchers often disregard this monster as a big dumb brute without any semblance of skill whatsoever. However, this can be attributed more to the hiring requirements for the actors and strongmen who have have the appropriate stature to play the character convincingly. These actors have likely never used a sword in their life, and we have to separate this clumsiness and lack of finesse as a limitation of the show. By the same metrics, Jamie Lannister, the finest swordsman in Westeros, is a useless turd of a duelist. Sorry Nikolai, but you can't have the looks of Prince Charming made flesh, be a phenomenal actor, and then also be a top tier swordsman. This is reality, not Westeros, and that just isn't fair. Gregor is actually a skilled fighter who lives for violence, a fully trained knight quoted as having good warrior instincts and being faster than a man his size ought to be. And though not outright confirmed, he is speculated to be one of the three who gives a yet-to-be-humbled Jamie Lannister pause. Though this is a show-only quote, however, it was when George was heavily involved with the show, so make of that what you will. He's also relentless, able to push past mortal wounds to finish off his enemy, even when soundly defeated. To say he has a warrior's grit is a bit of an understatement. Able to wield a six-foot greatsword, basically like a one-handed arming sword, alongside a a huge oaken shield, and on top of that he's clad in armor so thick that no one else can wear it, let alone fight in it. Not to mention the mail, leather, and gambeson underneath that, because apparently impenetrable plate needs even more defensive redundancies. And even if all of this is stripped away from him, he can rip most people in half with his bare hands. He's not the most talented or skilled fighter, but at 8 feet tall, 400 pounds all of it muscle by the way, his physicality, along with the equipment this allows him to wield, pushes him from pretty good into the top tier. He's basically a one-trick pony, but that one trick is being a human tank in a time period where rocket launchers and other anti-tank goodies aren't available yet, with his opponents only able to wield more primitive can openers that require you to get up close and personal with this monster, something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Tom. Now he did lose to Oberyn who used a spear and caution, but do remember Oberyn is made out to be something of a prodigy on all fronts. Your average Joe couldn't pull off Oberyn's tactic. He may be a black-hearted bastard and alongside Ramsay one of the only pure evil characters in A Song of Ice and Fire, but as much as I hate him, his place on this list is more than justified. Size matters. It sucks, but it's true. At number 9, it's Bronn. Now the opinion on Bronn is extremely bipolar. Some think he's the best thing since sliced bread who can beat just about anyone, and some of us have read the books. However, even the book version of Bronn is worthy of your respect as a fighter and is in my opinion a little underrated, and edges his way into the bottom of this list. He may not have lordly training, but Bronn shows time and time again that he is skilled, cunning, resourceful, and immoral. A perfect combination if one wants to survive in Westeros. His lower born upbringing has provided him with a meat and potatoes approach to combat. He knows what works and what doesn't. He's also very observant, identifying the weakness in his opponent and exploring exploiting it at the first possible opportunity. Bronn is willing to do what it takes to win, and in a world as unfair as Westeros, that kind of mentality can take you a long, long way. Whether in single combat or skirmish slash battlefield environments, Bronn seems very much at home, quoted as moving like a panther, and I believe Tyrion even compares him to Jaime at one point if memory serves me right. Not to mention he keeps coming through the other end with gains rather than losses. You just can't do that if you're not a cut above most people. A lot of people doubt Bronn's ability being top tier 
here, often bringing up his refusal to take on the mountain. But one thing often left to the wayside is this. Cersei, an arrogant, egotistical, entitled brat who likely viewed Bronn as little more than scum, saw fit to offer him marriage into the nobility to prevent him standing for Tyrion. This kind of leads me to think both Tywin and Cersei thought that Bronn was far from dead meat and didn't even want to chance it. If Bronn's goose was so cooked, why not let him fight, die, and ensure both Tyrion and his dangerously ambitious companion's death, and eliminate the risk of Jaime having a last-minute crisis of conscience, or worse, a better fight at taking Bronn's place. You know, like what actually ended up happening. Bronn had it in him to beat Gregor, even if it wasn't guaranteed. A healthy dose of knowing your limitations and a self-imposed reality check of your chances also factors into fighting skill in our estimations. A means you'll come out of most fights at the very least alive because you'll know when it's time to retreat and escape. He may not be the best, but our favorite sellsword is definitely many, many cuts above average and should be made to feel welcome on this list. At number 8, we have Brienne of Tarth. Taking just the show depiction alone, there's an argument to place this badass lady in the top 5, as just like Bronn, she's been given a little power boost. However, like Bronn, Brienne is a lot more grounded in the books. She's good. Like, better than most good. Like, Definitely elite level on the talent front, able to defeat Loris Tyrell who's no slouch himself during Renly's tournament. But Brienne is also very young and inexperienced and a little overrated by fans of just the show, who see her as this unstoppable murder tank who defeated both the Hound and Jaime in combat. The context of those fights is incredibly important. The Hound fight doesn't happen in the books and even in the show it's clear the Hound is not at 100%. He's tired, starving, wounded and the refusal to cauterize his wound depicted earlier means he's likely in the early stages of sepsis. Definitely not in a fit state to fight someone as good as Brienne, especially when she's already got the advantage of a Valyrian steel sword, despite being a better, more experienced warrior himself at full strength. The Jaime fight in the show does make some effort to show that Jaime is not quite 100%, let's be fair, allowing Brienne a comfortable victory. But the book makes it crystal clear it takes absolutely everything Brienne has just to keep Jaime, whose fuel tank is at less than 50% at bay, and her victory is not nearly as clean. Anyway, ramble over, we're here to explain why despite this misconception of her badassery, she still belongs in the top 10. Brienne is big, strong, quick, and skilled, but what makes her so dangerous is her grit. She learns quickly that anything goes in a fight, and while not a dirty dishonorable fighter like Bronn, she will do what it takes to win and leverage her size and strength the second she has the opportunity. She's also full of self-doubt, but whereas in most characters this could be viewed as a weakness, it only seems to fuel her fire in her desire to prove herself and pushes her to perform at her best. She's not as badass as she's made out to be in the show, but Brienne definitely deserves to be on this list. Would you want to fight her in single combat? Hmm, no, didn't think so. Do you have a big long essay comment that we just have to see? Well, post it to YouTube because it's good for our engagement analytics, but if you'd like to tell us how wrong we are more directly, feel free to check out our Discord server linked in the description. At number 7 we have Tom's obligatory lightning pick that helps keep the video's length down and has nothing at all to do with the lack of footage of said character, and that is Garland Tyrell, Loris Tyrell's older brother. Garland is basically a Westerosi Jedi and has become so good at swordsmanship that he casually fights multiple opponents at once while training, as some kind of relaxing meditation exercise to keep him drilled for actual battle instead of namby-pamby sparring. Marjorie is adamant that Garland be the one to stand for her in her trial by combat against the Faith, and will accept no one else by choice. To have that kind of unshakable faith in someone when it comes to your own life is a heck of an endorsement. George R. R. Martin has also said that Loris is one of the best fighters in the realm, and Loris himself has admitted that Garland is better than he is. Enough said, really. At number 6, we have Sandor Clegane, better known as the Hound. This guy is honestly one of the best, and it genuinely feels like a crime to us that we couldn't find a spot for him in the top 5. But if Gregor Kidd keeps the top tier, then Sandor damn sure holds the door closed on the Elite. The Hound is what you get when you take the sword skills of Jaime Lannister, sprinkle in some of the immorality and cunning of Bronn, and combine it with the size, strength, and savagery of the Mountain. I wouldn't put it past him to take every fighter below him, and in all honesty, I think he could quite quite easily punch up through most of the fighters above him and take them down if he's having a good day. After Jamie lost his hand, George R. R. Martin himself said that the Hound should not be out of consideration for the best swordsman alive. And while we've made our thoughts on the word of God as not infallible clear, it's still a heck of an endorsement. The Hound is borderline unstoppable in a duel or on the battlefield and is afraid of just one thing, that being fire. And even in the end, he was able to confront that fear and take down his zombified brother, a feat I think maybe only a couple of 
of the top five could have also pulled off. This is definitely one dog you don't want to mess with. And here we are, the top five, the cream of the crop, and definitely not where the arguments are going to start. At number 5 we have Barristan the Bold, or Barristan the Badass as he's more affectionately known. I want to be clear we're discussing Barristan as we meet him, that being in his old age and a touch more frail than his prime self. Prime Barristan would take the number 1 spot for me handily, and yes that includes over you Star Sword Boy. However, even with his advanced age, Barristan is unstoppable. Seriously, the only thing that keeps Westeros safe from his wrath is the fact that he's one of the only characters in the Thronesverse that possesses a moral compass and at least understands the concept of honor. He's the quintessential ideal of a knight and is top class in the skills that accompany it. Again, show only quote and speculation, but Barristan is thought to be alongside the Clegane brothers as one of the only three who are yet to be humbled Jaime Lannister thinks could beat him. When you can be surrounded by five fully armored knights, many members of the City Watch, while you yourself are missing half your plate and the drawer of your sword provokes this reaction, you know Barristan's statements regarding cakes, cheese, and the cutting of are not hyperbole. A small show detail that I always appreciated in this scene also backs up just how deadly Barristan is, and it's this moment when the Hound places his hand very cautiously on his sword but doesn't draw it. This is the goddamn Hound, a man that fears no one and isn't scared to casually cross swords with the mountain. Yet here he is, the only one with the sense not to antagonize Selmy further, but also knew for well he was going to be the only one left to defend King Dick Hedus in Bredis had Selmy actually attacked. His show death was halfway between epic and and underwhelming in our opinion, considering he was taken down by knife-wielding peasants, albeit while completely outnumbered and unarmored. But those in the know are aware it was budget control for the show and Tyrion kind of needed his spot, and he'll probably have a more heroic end in the books. If I could pick one knight to have at my side in a scuff, it would be Selmy every single time. You know he's got your back and no one's getting through, and he deserves his spot in the top five. Age be damned. At number 4 we have everyone's favourite Dornish Prince and that is Oberyn Martell. Oberyn's a bit of a funny one, out of everyone on the list I think he's the only one who could comfortably defeat the entire top 10 in a trial by combat scenario. His use of poisons and the way he tailors his weapon and armour choice to counter whatever advantage his opponent has means his enemy is perpetually on the back foot and always one single cut away from rapid death. Bloody Martell. The cause appears to be a manticore venom. It is the Death's Head Manticore. He's also had a life of action, both soldiering and in a gladiatorial context, and come out the other side intact and seemingly no worse for wear. We know from looking at the armaments of his daughters, whom he personally trained to fight, that he knows his way around many weapons, from the standard to the esoteric and exotic, and I don't doubt he's just as deadly with them as he is with his spear. So why the bottom of the top five? Unlike our Jamie vs Oberyn video where we were considering both warriors at their most optimum and prepared setup, which we probably should have made a little clearer in that video, this list is considering them in all facets of combat, which includes catching them with their pants down and only their signature weapon and armor to hand. Oberyn's greatest strengths are his intelligence, cunning, and experience with what beats what. He is an anti-meta fighter who tailors his loadout to best deal with what's in front of him specifically instead of wielding utilitarian versatility. If you deprive Oberyn of preparation catch him before his blade's poisoned, or force weapon and armor parity on him, he loses quite a bit of his killing potency, and he becomes less dangerous to the best warriors around. The key word there, however, is less dangerous. Regardless of what he's wielding, he's still one of the most talented warriors alive during the Game of Thrones if reputation is to be believed, and I believe he could still acquit himself admirably against the top five regardless of equipment. The way he manhandled the mountain in both mediums still stands as one of the most badass fights ever put to fiction. His place on this list is earned, I won't hear otherwise. At number three we have Jamie Lannister beforehand went, bye bye. But that said Oberyn beats Jamie. Yes, we did, and we stand by it. In a grounded universe like Thrones, styles make fights, and in the context of that video, we believe Oberyn is the better warrior. However, this list encompasses all types of scuffs, and in this regard, mainly the without prep section, we think Jamie is a little higher than Oberyn. Oberyn is deadly because he pays attention to the strengths and advantages of his opponent and figures out a counter, which means if you allow him preparation, he can beat just about anyone. However, Jamie is deadly by skill alone and nothing else. His weapon preference 
against any type of opponent is the longsword, because he can get the job done with it regardless of his opponent's arms. George R. R. Martin has even said he's not just one of the greatest swordsmen around at the time of the game, but one of the greatest in the history of the Thronesverse, with only Barristan and Dane spoken of in a similar manner. Jaime is a one in a million warrior. I mean by the old gods and the new, when we wanted to use him in a versus video, we had to pick an opponent who would purposefully stack the deck against him pre-fight, and let's be real, employs tactics that would, in any other universe, absolutely be considered cheating. Taking Jamie down fair and square is not on the cards for pretty much everyone below him on this list, with the sole exceptions of the Hound and Barristan if the day is favouring our favourite dog or grandpa knight. So if Jamie is one in million, why don't he get the number one spot? Purely and simply because of his arrogance. It makes him overly confident and reckless and this bites him on the arse more than once in the story. That's it. Teach Jamie a bit of humility and patience without losing the hand and he would likely be immovable from that number one spot. If we do it your way, Kingslayer, you'd win. We're not doing it your way. At number two, we have Jamie's mentor and idol, and that is the Sword of the Morning, Sir Arthur Dane. Because it just wasn't enough for us to piss every Jamie fan off with the Jamie Oberyn video's conclusion, we also had to put most people's auto number one pick for best warrior in Westeros in the number two spot. But before you think we're being spiteful, we do have reasons why. Dane deserves to be up here, and there are great arguments to put him at number one. But there are a few reasons we bumped him down to number two in favour of our number one pick. Dane was a legendary swordsman and warrior, and this was an undeniable fact. But since he's dead at the beginning of the story, his skills are reminisced on by other characters, mainly Jaime Lannister who makes it abundantly clear he's Dane's number one fanboy, and Ned Stark who held undying respect for the Sword of the Morning and was himself a lesser warrior by comparison. My father beat him. Did he? We're not saying he didn't have the skills they talk about, but we are personally under the impression that because Dane was part of what you could call a golden era of knights, that perhaps his skills are remembered through slightly rose-tinted glasses. Which leads us on to our next point, and that is, unlike our number one pick, Dane was killed in combat, in his full prime, while wielding a weapon that gives Valyrian steel swords a run for their money. And while it's true we don't know how it went down in the books yet, and the odds could have been much worse, it's likely things played out in a similar manner to the show, and Dane ended up killed because he didn't keep his wits about him in a chaotic skirmish. Which is a bit of a scuff on his nearly spotless record, when you consider the opponents were not exactly legends like him. Despite this, however, it's clear that Dane was reaching for that top spot as a warrior. Jamie, the once in a generation talent, might have crossed swords with the smiling knight and kept his head when he was a wee lad, but it was actually Dane who put the monster down. This wasn't a two bit bandit either. Several sources seem to confirm that the smiling knight was himself a legendary swordsman, with Jamie comparing him to Gregor Clegane on the savagery front. Killing him was no mean feat, and few could have actually done it if the reputation matches the monster. Dane is also regarded as an exact equal to Barristan on the skill front, and we all know how badass Mr. Somi is, with only the modifier of Dawn giving Dane an edge. So who in the Seven Kingdoms could have slapped Dane's hand away from the fandom's coveted number one Westerosi warrior trophy? Ooh, try saying that ten times in a row. Why, it's Joffrey Baratheon! They know I saved the city. They know I won the war. I broke Stannis on the Blackwater. Pity you weren't there to help, uncle. All joking aside, we know that you already know who it is. Of course it's our main man, the king himself, the guy who you want with you on every battlefield and at every party. It's King Bobby B when he was young. Oh, it's funny, is it? So, why does young Robert get the number one spot in our eyes? Well, for a start, this guy's big. Not quite Gregor Great John Hodor big, but he's only an inch or two away from Sandor's height, and he's built like a brick shit house. So he's in that highest league of physicality. Like it or not, size matters, because it's a natural strength and reach advantage. Bobby is immensely bordering on inhumanly strong, able to casually swing a warhammer around that Ned couldn't even lift off the ground. Though we will admit its depiction is ludicrously unrealistic, even someone as strong as Gregor likely wouldn't be able to wield it in real life. But hey, George said that depiction is accurate, so that's what he uses. It's also implied from his being quote, muscled like a maiden's dream, that he wasn't overly bulky. Which means he would have also likely been exceptionally fast. Not fast for a man his size like Gregor, but just fast point blank. 
Then factor in his intelligence. Bobby was thought of as a fool by many, but that was only when it came to politics and ruling. In the fields of commanding and combat, however, he was a scholar without equal, and was borderline undefeatable on the battlefield, having only ever lost one battle in his life. Given his noble birth, he'll likely have also had the highest quality of training, and to top that off, it's clear he had heaps of natural talent. Then to top that off, Robert is just genuinely passionate about fighting and winning. He doesn't fight to live, he lives to fight. One only has to look at his decline when the battles dried up to see he fuels himself through life and death combat. But even all this isn't the reason we're giving him the number one spot over Dane. It comes down to one thing and one thing only. He's the only top tier fighter in Westeros with the exception of Oberyn who has any bloody common sense when it comes to weapons and armor. Jaime, Dane, and Selmy are all immensely skilled and wisely opt for full plate armor just like Robert does. But when given the choice of arms for battle, those fools all opt for a longsword in a realm where plate armor is a common sight on their enemies. Long swords, well, swords in general to be honest, are pants versus plate armor. And while you can make them work against it, you either need very specialized techniques or to be targeting the small gaps in the armor, all while your opponent is hammering away at you, quite literally in Robert's case. Bobby looks like the only guy in Westeros who said, hmm, impossible to cut armor, and getting in those gaps is an awful ball ache. Why don't I just hit him on Ed with something heavy and give him a forever nap, eh, Ned? Leaves more time for drinking and fucking that way. Even against plate, one good hit from a Warhammer, especially Bobby's unrealistic monstrosity in his freakishly strong hands, will at best hurt like an absolute bitch and stagger you, or at worst, the more likely of the two outcomes, break your bones. You also can't reliably perform a static block against a Warhammer with most weapons. Even with both hands on the weapon, the weight often just transfers through. And even direction shifting parries are risky, especially when the opponent is built like Robert is, leaving evasion as pretty much your only option. Even shields, while effective at stopping the blow, don't really like being struck by Warhammers. Your shield arm will not thank you for blocking it and will raise a little less high after every committed hit. A single good blow to the head, you're going down and you're not getting back up. Like, ever. This is true all the way from feisty little bravosi fencers like our main man Sirio, all the way up to armored human tanks like Gregor. When the best of Westeros go against Bobby, assuming both sides are armored, they would constantly be struggling to equalize the damage. Even Gregor, with his massive six-foot greatsword and thicker than normal armor, would need to be landing a good seven to eight direct blows just to match one of Robert's. Even in unarmored circumstances where the hammer loses its edge versus something like a sword, Robert was far from vulnerable as like Jamie, while he had a preference for a particular weapon, he was still extremely deadly with other arms, notably killing six men with a sword during the Battle of the Bells. And if I remember right, he was also recovering from recent wounds while he did this. Guy was clearly dangerous no matter what shape the steel was in his hands. He may not have the most prestigious kills to his name like Dane does with Old Smiley or Barristan does with Melees, but he did defeat Rhaegar Targaryen in single combat, and as far as we know, it was fair and square. And it's said that Rhaegar was absolutely not no slouch as a warrior, so it won't be scrubs that fill his resume, you can be sure of that. You don't get a moniker like Demon of the Trident for being anything less than an unstoppable force of nature in combat. And that, my friends, is why Bobby B is our number one pick. Ah, oh, I can already sense the comments, Tom. Who makes your top 10? Is there anyone we missed? Would you swap people around? Let us know down below. And that's our take. What did we get right? What did we miss? And what did we get wrong? I am sure you'll have no problem telling us with this one. Thanks for watching, guys.